Good afternoon. On behalf of the Johnson County Historical Society, I'd like to welcome all of you to our opening exhibition of Distilling the Discourse, the History of the Tavern in Johnson County. Hope everyone's found a seat. Well, those of you in the back, uh, you're going to stand there then. That, that's all right. We call our uh, exhibit Distilling the Discourse. I was a minority of one. I wanted to call it uh, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 98 students drunk in the Ped Mall. But more sensible and wiser heads prevailed, and uh, we have the more scholarly name, and that's as it should be. I want to also send thanks to uh, V.S. Naipaul, the uh, Nobel Prize winner for literature, who canceled his program in Iowa City this afternoon <laughs> about a week ago. Uh, I think he knew that we would draw from him, and uh, it would not be what Prairie Lights had hoped for. So thank goodness, I, I think that there wasn't room in this town for both of us, for the Historical Society and for Mr. Nepal. Could I introduce some important people? Uh, the Executive Director of the Johnson County Historical Society, and she might stand for your applause, uh, Margaret Wheating. Then we have, I think I'd call her the curator, would that be an, a good title, uh, Leanne Gero, who, when you go on the uh, tour of the exhibit here uh, shortly, uh, she put together what we talked about, I think it was about a six-month project, it's given birth today, you might say, and uh, could not have been done without her, and I told her it looks magnificent and scholarly and professional and so on. So Leanne, would you stand up, please? And Melissa Hodroff, your title would be, and forgive me, Director of Programs. Director of programs. She has arranged for this and other programs to happen and attended publicity with it, and I'm sure has helped Leanne in moments of angst as this project unfolded. Wouldn't that be true? And so I want you to stand up for well-deserved applause also, Melissa Hodroff. Am I qualified to be your host today? Well, I have a famous tavern last name. We were in business for 40 years. I bartended there on and off from 1962 to 1974, helping on football weekends when we were extremely busy, uh, also helping on St. Patrick's Day when we were uh, ultimately the busiest of all, one week's worth of business in one day, and then sometimes in the evenings to help out also. Probably the most famous night was August 9, 1974. I had come in from detasseling and, uh, for Pioneer Seed Corn, and Nixon uh, that night announced he was resigning the presidency. Well, the tavern filled up because people wanted to be there, I think, together for this historic moment, and there probably wasn't a Nixon fan in the audience. I, I don't think anyone would ever voted for him. And it got fuller and fuller and fuller. My dad was home resting, and I probably should have called him to come down. Well, everybody got a beer before the speech. Then after the speech, everybody wanted two drinks to toast this very happy event in American history, and I'd never been busier in my life. Uh, but people were very cooperative, and, and that was fun. Uh, we come from a family of uh, tavern people. Uh, we'll probably be mentioning uh, Fitzpatrick's, who is uh, a partial sponsor of this exhibit, along with the Stepping Up Project and uh, others who don't occur to me at the moment, but that's all right. Uh, Gary Fitzpatrick donated the artifact of the uh, punch bowl and goblet set that's displayed out here in the lobby and we figure it's around 1890. It's a silver plate, Barton and Reed, and really a collector's item. I think at an auction it would bring uh, uh, well over $1,000, but then I'm, I'm no expert on uh, that sort of thing. Uh, also, so he's a cousin. We're also related to Mr. Uh, Jim Tucker of Tuck's Place on my uh, mother's side, and of course he's recently sold his business to the Hanrahans. And then you might have heard of Kenny's Bar and Irene's Bar, and we also have a picture of Red John Kenny's father, Tom Kenny, who had a bar about the year 1900, and he and his employees are pictured in the exhibit. So that, that family had three different bars and were cousins of theirs as well. So uh, beer is in my blood, uh, hopefully below uh, 0.10. Okay. Uh, those who search for weird things in the exhibit will not find it. This is very scholarly. We don't have a bikini top from the uh, uh, Mr. Paul's Union Bar and all that stuff earlier in the year. You won't find it here. We're much more refined than that. Now let's get serious. November is a time when uh, many uh, Christian churches remember the dead. Uh, this week was All Souls Day. Uh, we remember them and we name them. 
November is also a time next Sunday when our nation remembers those who served in the U.S. military. We honor them and we name them. Well, ours is certainly a less sacred uh, task here, but we will be seeking in our exhibit to remember and name uh, some of the great saloons and bars of Johnson County, their owners, their bartenders, and most importantly, I would say, their customers. And you, as you go through the exhibit, I think you'll be reminded of um, all kinds of um, very famous places in Iowa City. We have a young crowd here, so some of these uh, bars may not be known to you, but I, and I would appreciate at a certain point participation from the audience. This, again, is not a uh, monologue. It's a uh, dialogue, if you will. Let's go back to the very beginning. Was liquor, uh, beer and liquor, whiskey, an important part of Johnson County? The answer is a resounding yes. You could go back to before there was even an Iowa City, and some of you already know this, July 4th, 1837, John Gilbert invited about a dozen men to his trading post south of town on Sand Road, about five miles from Highway 6 bypass, to toast the 61st birthday of the United States. And they had no less than uh, three barrels of whiskey. Now, I don't know how many ounces were in a barrel, but uh, there was a lot of whiskey left over, though each man gave a toast, sang a song, or told a story. So there was a lot of whiskey consumed. What was left over was given to the Indians. Palashik and his village was close by, said to be, by Irving Weber to be a, a village of about 1,700 Indians. And according to Weber, the celebration went on for a couple more weeks. Now, also arriving about this time was the first territorial governor of the Iowa Territory, one Robert Lucas, who was a strong foe of such goings-on, who was a, a, a strong advocate of temperance. So I'm sure when uh, Robert Lucas heard about uh, this goings-on, uh, he probably hit the roof in uh, Plum Grove, though I'm not sure he had built Plum Grove by that time, but let's pretend he did. So alcohol was in controversy even before there was an Iowa City. Then we'll go back to 1839, and those of us on that bar tour a couple weeks ago stopped at the corner of Brown and Gilbert, where G.T. Andrews and ASAP, A-S-A-P-H, Allen, uh, built an uh, inn, a hotel, if you will, and a tavern. And that's the first one in Iowa City, and that was in um, October of 1839, and they paid $40 for the license. Believe me, it's considerably more now, but in those days, $40 was uh, a great deal of money if you think about it. Also, one more early story, and I'll leave that era. When they sold all the lots for Iowa City, I was fascinated, and again, Weber is my source, where the senior center is there on uh, Lynn Street between Iowa Avenue and Washington was the uh, Lean Back uh, Inn, Lean Back Hotel. And men stayed there uh, beginning in about 1838, 1839, and gathered there when they were selling the lots for what's now Iowa City. And it was called the Lean Back because there was only one room in this inn, and about 30 or 40 men would have to sleep on the floor, pick out their spot, kind of like a... Um, uh, eighth grade girls slumber party in somebody's living room, only larger numbers. And when they uh, filled the place, the other men had to lean against the wall and sleep that way, hence lean back. And they did uh, have alcohol involved in the various selling of lots in Iowa City. I'm sure the lot where we are sitting right now. And I want to quote from the great historian and political scientist, Benjamin Shambaugh of the University of Iowa. Of course, uh, anybody who doesn't know Benjamin Shambaugh should leave the room now because you're in the wrong place. Uh, quoting Shambaugh, in 1839, when the sale of lots at auction began, alcohol was a significant part of that day. On the morning of the first day of the sales, a large number of people assembled at Lean Back Hall. Many of the potential customers began the day with drinks. It was a jolly good-natured crowd that listened to the auctioneer, one Mr. Doherty of Dubuque, as he announced from a wagon in front of Lean Back Hall that lots would be knocked down to the highest bidder, that the purchase would be required to pay one-fourth of the cost of the lot in cash, and the remainder they could pay in six, 12, or 18-month intervals. From time to time, when the auction was going on, the crowd adjourned back inside the lean-back hall for more refreshments, that is, for drinks. Sometimes a happy purchaser, if he got the lot he wanted, or lots, would stand the drinks for the entire crowd. And so uh, many were there, I think, just for such refreshments. So alcohol, uh, very lively there in at least three cases. Let's leave that era and go to uh, the time of 1880 to about 1900. Let's say we were going to wander around Iowa City after this meeting and wet our whistle, though, of course, we wouldn't be in this building. 
But where would we go? Probably the most famous one would be a block up the street on the corner of College and Dubuque, the southwest corner, Frank McInerney's Saloon. And I'm sure that's known to all of you. It was famous for its 150-foot-long bar, said to be the uh, largest, longest one west of Chicago, certainly the longest one in Iowa. So let me put that in perspective. That would be 25 men six foot tall. Now, I'm six foot two, so uh, let's say uh, 23 or 24 of me laid in, and uh, there was McInerney's Bar, stretching from the, practically the front door clear back to the alley halfway down Dubuque Street there. That, that, was, uh, that would probably be one place we'd stop. And uh, thanks to one of the people in our audience, uh, Mr. Rittenmeyer, Ted Rittenmeyer, we have an artifact you'll see on your exhibit. He was the first one to bring an artifact in, uh, a 1903 advertisement for uh, McInerney's Old Capital Whiskey, which I believe sold for a dollar a quart in those days. And you'll notice we have a display. There's uh, pins and needles inside. I don't know if that was a bribe for the uh, whiskey purchaser's wife or girlfriend or what, when he brought the whiskey home to give her these needles, uh, I'll let you speculate that as you go by. But uh, Mr. Redmire brought us this 98-year-old artifact. It's one of the oldest things we have on display, and I thank him for that. Where else might we have gone? We could have gone to Riley's Saloon. Uh, Mike Riley, uh, he and his wife and the McInerney's played cards uh, to, for relaxation. They went to church together at St. Patrick's there right in the neighborhood. And he had a place at Clinton in College, not far from McInerney's. And he built a hotel in 1902. It's still there across from the depot. It's that building that's right there. I think it's called Wright Street, facing Clinton Street, left-hand side. Students live there now. That'll be a two, 100 years old next year, and that's Mike Riley's hotel. That wasn't where his bar was, but he used bar profits to build this hotel. So we could go to Riley's. Or if we were hungry and maybe we wanted to uh, mix with a little higher class of people, we could go to Cap Lauer's on Washington Street where Wainer's Jewelry used to be, and some of you remember where Wainer's was. Cap catered to the businessmen of the town more than the working men of the town, the, the people that ran the businesses, and he had one of those free saloon lunches that were popular in those days. So maybe you could have uh, pork or uh, beef and uh, pickles and onions and, and all the trimmings, and this was a little freebie that we got there. Or maybe we want to go down to Dunkel's. Charlie Dunkel had a place on southeast corner of College in Buke. We go into Dunkel's and have a beer. Or maybe we, wanted, maybe we were a German and wanted to, didn't want to go to all these Irish places and wanted to go to Mr. Geiger's place. Uh, F.X. Geiger, probably Francis Xavier Geiger, and he owned a place called the Senate. And it was right where the park is now, kind of across from the Jefferson Building, there on Dubuque Street, just below Washington. And it was called the Senate. And it was there to the turn of the century and a little bit beyond. And those of you who've lived in town a long time know that uh, this Geiger's son, uh, Waldo, was a prominent person in town. And uh, Tony, his son, and I uh, forget the other guy's name, were in school about the time I was. The Geigers are gone now, but uh, they were a prominent family in their day. Or let's go up to John's Grocery, which wasn't John's Grocery at the turn of the century. There was a bar there, too. Jacob Moore, only M-O-R-H, if I pronounce that right, had a bar there beginning around 1900. So there was another place we could go. Or our last drink, and that would be our, uh, let's see, that'd be our eighth stop. Maybe that's too many. Oh, no, wait, I forgot one. We'll take uh, Slezak Saloon, which is where Poly Eyes is now. That was built in 1875, that building on uh, Lynn near uh, Bloomington, just north of there. And we go to Slezak Saloon. That was popular with Bohemian people and people staying at the two hospitals because in those days, University Hospital was on this side of the river, about where East Hall and the physics building are in through there. And then also, of course, Mercy Hospital is where it was. People would stay in the hotel there and have their lunches at um, Slezak Saloon. And I, I guess they served a real good uh, bohemian, uh, probably lots of sauerkraut and kolaches and so on, so on. That's seven, our last stop. Then we go to Grady's Bar. And Mr. Grady's grandson, I think Jack Grady, still resides in town. That was on South Dubuque Street, 200 block between um, College and Burlington. And that one was famous for having a restaurant on one side and a bar on the other. And the men would go in the bar and drink, and uh, 
men and women could eat in the restaurant. Mrs. Grady ran the restaurant, as I understand it. Mr. Grady ran the bar. And there was one mysterious lady whose name will never be known, I guess, who would knock on the door and have the little uh, thing to put the beer in. And we have one of those on display, too, from about 1910, not from that bar, but a little container you'd carry beer in. It, uh, today's students would laugh at it because it would last them about 30 seconds the way some of them carry on. But uh, she'd knock on the door and they'd fill it with beer and she'd take it over to eat it with her uh, uh, lunch. And we do talk about in our displays, uh, women uh, this didn't frequent the saloons of 100 years ago. Uh, there, there was no law against it, but there were strong social mores and the custom was they didn't go in there. And that was to change, I would say, uh, post-prohibition and certainly post-World War II. And uh, I can recall going in Donnelly's Tavern as a paper boy and there were a couple of regular women in there who would come in after work and have one or two glasses of beer and, and be on their way. And, uh, were uh, certainly part of the crowd and well respected. And of course, later on, women began to own their own bars. So we have several that own them today. Leah Cohen comes to mind with Bo James and also Mrs. Uh, Kunsel, who owns um, Hilltop and owned another one that burned down. Uh, had a bad fire on the south side, so I guess she's down to one now. And of course, Irene Kenny was another tavern owner of the 70s. But I don't think you'll find any women. And I'll pause there. Does anyone know of a woman tavern owner uh, prior to 1950 uh, that? Uh, I know you were little children then, but maybe your parents told you about it. Uh, oh, come in and have a seat, uh, the, those of you in the back now. Do sit down, please. Okay. Uh, let's say goodbye to that era. Let's say goodbye to that era. And uh, now we'll go to uh, 1950, 1960. And this maybe is in the memory of a lot of you. And uh, again, we're going to have about six drinks. We're going to make that many stops. Three of these bars alone, uh, I'll take that back, four of these bars alone uh, have existed for a total of 225 years. Now let that sink in, longer than the history of the United States, or about, almost exactly as long, uh, 1776, 2001. Uh, what is that, 225 years? And what are those? Well, the oldest bar uh, in Johnson County, uh, Dave's Foxhead there on the uh, northeast corner of Gilbert and Market, uh, owned by the Elberhasky family, as far as I know, continuously since the repeal of Prohibition. The father's name was Bernie, and now the son' uh, name is Dave Elberhasky, and that's right across from John's Grocery to the north. Then you have in that same block George's Buffet, built in 38, opened in 39, so that's been around 62 years, where Dave's Fox had, I would claim, 67. Uh, owned by George Konyak, K A N A K originally, aren't you pleased that I can speak fluent Czech? And uh, now owned by a, a nice gentleman named Mike Carr, who has donated uh, a couple of artifacts to our exhibit, and we thank him for that. If you're ever in Solon, I go into his restaurant called McRide's Landing. I'm sure he'd appreciate that free commercial. There's a lot of historical pictures at downtown Solon, McBride's Landing. Another one comes to mind, the airliner, which has been around now 56 years. The Ranellos were there in the beginning. Uh, some of you may have remembered the... Uh, Waitresses, oh, there was Astrid. I think she and her husband, Bob, were, part, were owners at one time. You may remember Astrid. Can't remember her last name at the moment. And there was Gladdy. Gladdy had uh, low tolerance for some of the male students, but uh, she kept her, kept her job. Uh, we have Donnelly's Tavern, 40 years, 1934, 1974. You add those four together, the airliner, Donnelly's, Bernie's, and George's Fay, and you have 225 years. And then I, I'm leaving out, and I shouldn't, Joe's place, which uh, was the original name of Donnelly's Tavern for a short time. Joe Vitosh is the name there, V-I-T-O-S-H. And then later Joe's Place moved up to Iowa Avenue where it's been there, uh, oh, going back to the 40s again, I would say. And we have a picture of, of uh, Joe's Place you want to see in your tour going back to the 1940s. The booths look about the same to, to me. And then there's last chance, first chance. Everybody calls it the last chance, but when you think about it, uh, coming into town, it was the first chance. And there's an artifact uh, behind their bar that we don't happen to have here, but I would uh, have you go look at it on Prairie du Chien and Dodge that has 1933 on it. And supposedly on one side it says last chance, and they tell me if you turn it over, it says uh, first chance. That is now, of course, called the Hilltop uh, Lounge. I'm just going to throw out names. We, uh, history, of course, is uh, people places, things uh, at its most basic level. If I have said Joe Vitosh, does that conjure up a person? Uh, Whitey Michael, who had a bar 
downtown and later had one. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Hawk's Nest. Hawk's Nest. And later moved up north, uh, north of Pearson's, where Tux is now, uh, once upon a time. Uh, that brings to mind the very famous story that will uh, remind you of two Iowa Cityans of prominence. Uh, former Councilman Dean Thornberry, who's a uh, contemporary of mine, and Dick Lee, who retired as a uh, well-respected Iowa City policeman here a few years ago. He started back in the 50s. Well, one night, uh, Dean Thornberry and uh, three or four of his uh, City High buddies stopped in front of um, Whitey Michael's Tavern to get a case of beer. The one problem was they either were still in City High or shortly recently graduated from there. And of course, uh, we had a 21 law. They dropped Dean off, and the others went around the block. And uh, I know their names. I don't know why I'm picking on Dean, mentioning him and not the others. But anyway, they went around the block. And who should come along but Dick Lee in the squad car as Dean is carrying the case of beer out the door of uh, Whitey Michael's bar? Dean supposedly said to the officer, I'm taking this home for my father. So Dick Lee, uh, being the smart gentleman he was, says, well, let's jump in the squad car, and I'll help you take it home to your father. Um, so out they went to uh, his father, who I should parenthetically add was mayor of Iowa City at that time, so this was probably not a uh, welcome thing on the stoop there, one of the city policemen bringing the son of the mayor home for uh, having a case of beer. So uh, I, all I know is Dean went into the armed forces not too many months after that and uh, became a successful businessman and city councilman and a, a good friend of mine, and so much for that. I'm not going to tell a story about every one of these names, but that one just came to mind. How about if I said George Cognac, Jimmy Wallace, who's still with us. Jimmy's 90, and he was a longtime employee at George's Buffet. I think he may have been the owner through part of that era. Uh, Bernie Elberhasky, Dan Berry, who's out of the bar business but now in the real estate business, and I think was Realtor of the Year not too long ago in Iowa City. Uh, Frank Stalkfleet, they had Stalkfleet's Hideaway there off of Kirkwood. Well, the early bar is out that way, and I think his son still owns uh, one in Corville and one in Iowa City. I, I, I want to say the Deadwood, but don't quote me on that one. And then there's one in Corville he owns also. Uh, Red John Kenny, uh, K-E-N-N-E-Y. Uh, his wife, Irene. Uh, Harold Donnelly, a uh, fine gentleman. Uh, Charlie Grimm. Astrid, that I mentioned. Gladdy. Uh, and I smiled about her because she... Uh, uh, Chased some of my friends out of the airliner several times. Roscoe Hall, Vince Clear. Some people in the audience are nodding and saying, I remember those guys. Don Kessler, who owned the Hawk Ballroom, who owned Kessler's, who owned Little Bill's. I think he had three in his day. The Ranellas, who opened the airliner in 45. Max Yoakum, another city councilman quite controversial, who was a house mover. And, but he also owned a bar. Uh, in, and uh, if you didn't know Max Joachim, you missed a uh, uh, very interesting gentleman. Uh, also, I must mention, as you go out through the exhibit, you're going to see references to Iowa City's three breweries, all on the uh, 300 block of market. And I'll just name them. Uh, one was the um, Union Brewery. And that was the one owned by Hudson Geiger that uh, later became Economy Advertising, is now the uh, uh, owned by uh, lawyer Mark Moen and his associates and houses their law offices and also a, a um, you can get your hair done there, I think both sexes can. And also a massage parlor in the basement, a legitimate one. Uh, later on, Hudson Geiger uh, sold the, their operation to the Graffs. The Graffs were related to the Hudson Geigers, and that's a well-known Iowa City name in the beverage business. And also another brewery was the Great Western Brewery, and that was owned by Mr. Rupert, later owned by Dostal. And that's where Gilpin Paint is now. And then the third one was the Englert Brewery, which was really across the street on the uh, south side of 300 Block of Market, owned by the Englerts originally. Uh, Rittenmeyer came in there also. And, uh, and Ted, is that a relative at all? Yes. It is indeed. Okay, I'm not surprised. Uh, Lewis Englert was my great-grandfather as well as F.S. Rittenmeyer. Okay. All right. And then Dostal eventually got a hold of that one, too. But you had three breweries. Today we have two in the whole county. Fitzpatrick's, the brewery down on uh, Prentice and Gilbert. And then there's one in Solon. And there's almost three because it's right across the county line in Amana, but we, we don't count that because we're not the Iowa County Historical Society. Uh, might mention in passing that in 1900, 
there was a law that you could only have one saloon for every 1,000 people. And we do have a nice map out there that shows you how many saloons there were in 1878, 1900, 1940, and I believe now 2001. And uh, guess which era has the most uh, saloons? Does the audience want to want to guess? Two, 2001 wins hands down, yes. Um, I would remark today it's more like one bar for every 100 underage students uh, rather than one bar for every 1,000 people in the town. But that's just a... That's a personal opinion, not an opinion of the Johnson County Historical Society. Uh, they had no uh, place to sit down in these saloons. You had to stand. They figured uh, if you couldn't stand up, you should be on your way. That always makes me smile. Uh, you had to be able to see in the bar. There couldn't be uh, uh, frosted or stained glass where you couldn't see in. And there couldn't be any back door where you could duck in for a quick beer and duck back out. Uh, that wasn't permitted either. Uh, now, of course, let's see, Fitzpatrick's has a back door, uh, Hilltop has one, um, uh, uh, several places in town do, those two come to mind anyway. I'm almost done here because I do want to involve you and you've, you've been a very good uh, audience here because we're, we're running um, past time. To my left is an artifact we dearly wanted to display, but there's no display case big enough to house it. This was donated by Leah Cohen, who is the owner of Bo James, some kind of uh, Greek goddess or, well, no, that isn't a Greek heritage, but some kind of uh, mythological woman holding up a globe of what could be uh, cut glass uh, put out by Schlitz, and uh, that would surely bring hundreds of dollars from a collector at uh, auction, and I, I thank uh, uh, Leah Cohen for donating that. Another thing that wouldn't quite fit in is just a common pony keg that was... Uh, one that was uh, commonly sold by Donnelly's Tavern and I'm sure is sold uh, quite prominently by John's Grocery today, among other, other places. You'll also see a, a tiger silkscreen picture in your tour, uh, kind of a hallmark of George's Buffet. Mike Carr gave that to us. And it was the Princeton Tiger. Years ago, they had murals painted on the wall with a big P on the tiger. And I haven't run down yet. Uh, Ted, do you know why there was a Princeton connection for George's the Fay? I doubt if Mr. Cognac went to Princeton uh, or anybody else associated with that. So I, I have yet to, that's a mystery to me. They once had a uh, tiger in a cage, and that's now at Wink's Bar in West Liberty. And uh, Mr. Winnicky was willing to sell it for about $500, but there didn't seem to be any uh, meeting of the minds on the price. And I don't know how it got down to West Liberty but it's down there now. I was kind of an intermediary and I went down there to see if they wanted to sell it to Mr. Carr who had heard about it. And so he's given us their modern day version of their tiger, the silk screen tiger. So look that one up if you will. And we have a copper spittoon that uh, is from Donnelly's Tavern of the era of the 1930s. Uh, John Kenny, grandson of Tom Kenny, sent along a couple old, old beer glasses from early in the 20th century, they're in a display case. You might want to check those out. I think those are, I don't know if charming is the word, but they're, they're something special. One thing that tickled me was uh, Donnelly's Tavern offered in the middle of World War II what looks like a matchbook, but you open it up and it has a needle and a little kit to repair your nylons. Uh, I understand that during the war uh, I was around, but I wasn't uh, paying much attention. I was uh, wetting my diapers. And um, I understand that they use the uh, nylon for parachutes and other such things, and that women truly couldn't buy nylons the way you could after the war and you can today. So this would have been a nice little item to, uh, for a man to take home to his wife. So that's another era thing. Um, we also have uh, a bung puller. Now, uh, you don't use the word bung very often in your conversation, but check out the bung puller. I'm not even going to say what that is. We have Erlanger bottle, an Erlanger bottle. Is that the beer that made Milwaukee jealous? Well, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. There's some dispute of whether that is the beer that made Milwaukee jealous or not. There's a, a Graf bottle. Oh, and by the way, Fitzpatrick's is soon to be brewing again soda pop at their facility. And, and that was a facility where uh, the Callahans owned the Graf bottling company as a kid. We used to drink sunshine beverages. Does that ring a bell with anybody in the audience? Sunshine pop cream and grape and uh, other flavors. Uh, Gary Fitzpatrick's going to bring that back. So things that come full circle on uh, that facility is for making pop. And we went from three breweries 
125, 140 years ago to having none, now to having two again in the county. So things do come, come in cycles. Invite your friends to come uh, to see this exhibit. It'll be here till December 31st, New Year's Eve. And uh, uh, I, I think they'll, they'll learn something about the town that they didn't know before. And that's always what the historical society is attempting to do. And we've taken what's always been a hot topic in Iowa City, alcohol, as I hope I've illustrated from the beginning, through now, as you well know, living in this era. And if you in our listening audience or out here can suggest other topics we might do in the year 2002 or 2003, we're always looking for other things to make history come alive for the uh, people of Iowa City and the whole county of Johnson. Thanks very much for coming.